What's going on, Hockey Town? It's Matt with Red Wings Diehards. Forrest is not going to be able to join me tonight. He's a bit tied up with some personal stuff. Um, obviously, this is a very somber evening now. A pretty poor week of hockey uh, from the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, we're going to get into it tonight and talk about what's next. So here we go. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to the sick podcast. the sick podcast. Hockey Town Hangout. Brings it in. Scores! Oh, his first NHL goal is a beauty! The sickest Detroit Red Wings podcast. It's going to be sick. Um, So, a number of things that we can discuss right now. Um, I'm trying... To, to keep a level head. Um, it's frustrating because, you know, on this podcast and on this Twitter account at the beginning of the year, we're pro- we were saying like, it's probably going to be like 88, 90 ish points, probably going to compete for a spot and ultimately end up missing slightly. And that seems like it's going to be pretty spot on. And like, that's cool. We were right about that, but living it out in real time is really frustrating. Um, this city and this team's had to endure a lot of really shitty hockey for the better part of a decade. Um, I mean, any Red Wings fans who have a birth year 2010 or later, like all they really know is pretty much mediocrity, which sucks. You have a whole generation growing up that's used to the Detroit Red Wings being mediocre that associates the winged wheel with mediocrity. And, um, and I'm not going to sit here and just bash the team because at the end of the day, despite this just horrendous collapse that's gone on the past few months here, not few months, sorry, few, several weeks, like five, six weeks, whatever it's been, they've improved. And, you know, there there are a number of holes on the roster for sure still. Um, I'm not going to sit here and, and be, you know, all pom-poms, but – the points percentage does continue to grow each year if you want something to hang your hat on. Um, but at the end of the day, this week was a big, the biggest week of Detroit hockey in the 2020s at the very least. And you could make the argument in, in an even bigger span of time, the biggest week of hockey, right? And like, you know, it's not over. They lost in overtime. They got a point. But like if they end up tied with anybody, they're, they have the least amount of regulation wins. So, um, you need a ton of help at this point. And um, you got three games left. Toronto is no easy task. You have Austin Matthews who's trying to score 70. So, like, all their players will be playing. And, like, Montreal is not just, like, a, a layover either, you know. They're not just going to lay down and roll over. And that's a divisional matchup, an original six matchup, and they'd love to spoil our season. So they've been playing well. They just put up nine on the Flyers the other day. Um. But what I will say is the goaltending and the defense. And you could make the argument like half the forwards. You could make the argument the coaching staff. I mean, there's a number of places that you could put the blame on all this. I mean, your last 20 games are 5, 12, and 3. 5, 12, and 3. 13 points in 20 games. Um, That's nowhere near the clip they were hitting in January and February. Uh, The last five weeks have just been an absolute masterclass on how to watch the ground beneath you give way. Um, And you could, you could, you could put it at, you could put the blame at the feet of any, any of those people, the bottom six forwards, you know, I mean, like uh, someone tweeted earlier, there's only like a few players that have scored three or more goals since March 1st. It's like Larkin, Raymond, and Kane. Everyone else says <laughs> less than that, and that's just insane. Um, the goaltending, I mean, Alex Lyon tonight. You know, I I try and give goalies as much of the benefit of the doubt as I can, but like some of those goals, man, I mean, he looks like a shell of himself and what he looked like six weeks ago. And what, what that, what that is, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, obviously he's, he's being asked more this year than he ever has before. Is that playing a role? 
Um, you know, it's not like he's sniffing 60 games, but still it's more than he's used to, I suppose. Um, the pressure, I mean, you know, from what we all thought, right, he was kind of a cool, calm, collected, goofy kind of guy. Didn't get rattled too easily, but geez, Louise, man, these these past number of starts, you know, I mean, a few a few good games here and there, but the body of work the last several weeks has not been good. Um, and you know, the defense too. I re I really like the presence that Edmondson brings to the blue line. I you know, he's not perfect. He makes a couple of miscues here and there, but you know, I think all of us have a little more patience for someone like him making some mistakes, especially considering. You know, when he's on his game, he looks pretty solid, a big body. I mean, you watch him tonight, you know, especially on the penalty kill, just takes up so much space. You know, his stick in the lane, his reach, his, his frame, you know, I mean, what a nightmare in terms of a matchup tool that a coaching staff could use. Um, but at the end of the day, there's just too many jags on the roster. And when I, when I say jag, I mean, just a guy. There's just too many, too many jags. Um, there's, there's too many of them. Too many passengers. And we tweeted it the other day. I mean, just too many of these veteran leaders not making the key play. I mean, you look at and you look at the overtime goal tonight. That's, I mean, that's two plays by JT Comfort in my mind that are on tape that are super super soft. And the game against Washington on the first goal, the Strom goal, he's wide open in the slot in the D zone opportunity to pick his head up, take a look and fire the puck somewhere where a body is not. Uh, he didn't. He just fired it away and was held in, fired it right to the guy. Like literally just a, just a quick little head pickup. That's all you needed to do, man. You make like $5 million a year. You'd think you would know that by now, but Hey, you make a mistake. And then, you know, you make an attempt to get down and block the shot. If I were you, I would have sold out considering the mistake I just made, but Hey, you can give a 65% effort too. That's your choice. And then tonight in the corner on the OT winner, I mean, I don't know, man, your season's on the line, your teammates, your first line has carried you to this point. I mean, you were signed. I mean, again, dude, it's the same thing with, with cop like last year. And like, I'm just, I'm worried that it's going to start happening with comfort too. It's just like invisibility cloaks for like 10 plus games at a time. And like defensively, sometimes you can even argue a majority of the time pretty okay. But like sometimes when, when, when it really matters, like where are you? Where are you? Lucas Raymond deserves a letter on his jersey on Saturday based off tonight. I mean, JT Confer, what I mean, you were brought in to be to bring that stability to, to that middle six to that second line, eh? Like I just, I'm having a hard time with how many of these veteran guys just down the stretch, nowhere to be found, nowhere to be found. And furthermore on that, um, what kind of decisions are being made amongst our pro scouting staff when, when we're identifying guys? And like, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and, and act like I know all the behind the scenes stuff of what goes on in scouting meetings and, you know, in, in team meetings and GM meetings and all that stuff. Don't want to sit here and act like I know all that goes into that. But obviously every team is different. Every team has their own processes in place. Every team structures it different. You know, I mean, for like... Our team doesn't have a director of pro scouting that I could find. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, let me know. I can't find one. Um, some teams, you know, have a director of pro and a director of amateur scouting. A team like Vegas, I'm pretty sure they just have a director of scouting period who like oversees it all. Um, so you can structure it kind of however you want. Some teams only have like a few pro scouts. Some have five, six, seven. I'm not sure if there's actual rules on it or not. Just from the brief research that I've done, seems like you can kind of structure it however you'd like. So I just I, I really want to know why teams like the New York Rangers, for example, let's just talk about the New York Rangers, for example, because that's on my mind. 
Andrew Cott played for the New York Rangers before coming to Detroit, played with the Winnipeg Jets before that. Okay. Um, if you remember, leading up to what would that have been? The summer of 22, that summer when we signed Cop and Perron and Sharat. I remember specifically John Bucciagras talking about Vinny Trocek being linked to coming to Detroit. Okay, fine, you know, whatever. You're getting to that point where you got to start adding some players. You know, I mean, if you take a look at that graphic that's been floating around Twitter of what, you know, our roster looked like during year one of Iserman, like it has come a long way. Still too many holes, still too many jags, but it has come a long way. You know, we're not fielding guys like Trevor Daly and Dmitry Timishov anymore. Let's just be honest. We're not. And that's a good thing. Still frustrating to live through this in real time. hundred percent. But anyways. So how come the New York Rangers, you know, they, I mean, they traded for cop. I'm pretty sure right at the deadline from Winnipeg. And, you know, they, I don't, I couldn't tell you what they gave up for them, but I mean, they were able to see like, Hey, there's not enough here to offer a four or five year deal for whatever he was getting four to 5 million, whatever it was. And then they go out and they get Trocheck. Trocheck's got like 75, 80 points right now. And cop has a broken cheekbone. And even before that super, super average third line center, like 20, 30 points. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't have it in front of me, but I just want to know how come, the pro scouts and the management staff in, in New York were able to identify that that cop isn't worth resigning and were able to identify a player in Trocheck to come in and be a really valuable top six center for them. You know, playing behind Mika Zibanejad, I'm pretty sure. I'm not going to act like I'm an expert at the Rangers lineup, but I'm pretty sure he's their second line center. I mean, like, how come they can identify that guy and get rid of the guy that we're like, yeah, let's give him five years or four years. I'm not sure exactly. You know, teams like, you know, Vegas, just super aggressive and seems like they're in on everybody. And it's like, what, who's making these decisions? Like, what did we do before offering cop term and money? Did we watch a six minute YouTube highlight video of him in Winnipeg and New York and be like, yeah, it's good enough. Like what, like, what are we actually watching to determine what we give these guys? I mean, like think between Mary and Hosa. And Patrick Kane, like 15 years. Like, can you think of, I mean, and even, even in those two cases, that was just one year piece. Who knows if Patrick Kane's going to come back after this collapse? So that's one year piece. That's not like anything lengthy. Can we think of any UFA acquisitions or even any like real trade acquisitions that have like produced some type of fruit with some longevity in terms of a player that's made an impact on the NHL roster for anything longer than a year. Who, what, what are we doing? Why can we not get these decisions right? On the blue line, I mean, we've talked at length about the guys on the blue line. I don't even want to do it anymore. Figure it out. I mean, it's not a coincidence that you bring in Simon Edvinson and he looks so good. I mean, you have to find a way to clear out some roster spots on the back end. I mean, are Albert Johansson and William Wallender even real people? I feel like I've been hearing those names for four or five years, and it's just like we're just going to keep signing depth defensemen. And I don't even think they're real people at this point, to be honest with you. That's my latest conspiracy theory. Um, I'm obviously kidding. But, or you know, you know, guys like Carter Mazur and, and Marco Casper, Jonathan Bergeron. I mean, it's like it's it's giving me Ken Holland vibes, man. Like we got these guys that we've drafted, and we got kind of a log jam at center now, because you have Larkin, Cop, and Comfer all with term. Danielson and Casper on the way. I mean, when are we going to see Nate Danielson? Twenty twenty eight. I just I don't doesn't make any sense to me because it's like you see these other organizations right they get these decisions right but again go back to the rangers jonathan quick 
Hello? We needed goalie help, obviously. We went out and got two more. No one, like Jonathan Quick, I think he's making like $4 million or something. Maybe less, I'm not sure. Like, what are we, like, can we not identify these things? Why do we stink at identifying adequate help to come in? And I don't even really hate the way we've been drafting. Like, I'm really optimistic about the drafts. I mean, obviously, Lucas Raymond is a freaking stud. You know, some people like to bash Mo Sider. I think he's going to be okay. I think an underrated aspect about Mo Sider that not enough people talk about is we got to figure out who his fucking partner is going to be. That guy needs a legit partner. And I really liked the idea of maybe trying to make a run at Noah Hannafin in the offseason, but obviously the Vegas Golden Knights decided to ruin that fun, but that's okay. But who's going to be Mo Sider's partner? Because do you really want it to be Simon Edvinson, or would you rather split those guys up and have them rule your top four? Simon Edvinson ASP pairing on the second pair? That'd be interesting to watch. Who can come in and be that guy for Mo Sider? Because I feel like Mo Sider, he has that offensive ability. I feel like he could be 50, 60 point guy. I really do think he could. If he had some stability back there and not have to like worry so much about being not only a little bit of offense guy, but also shut down D guy, right? And um, if we could just find him a real solid partner, because Ben Sherratt wasn't it. And I like Jake Wallman, but I really, I don't, I don't know if I see in him the type of partner I'm envisioning for Mo Sider, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, just, uh, I think that's a really underrated aspect. I think that needs to be talked about more. Got to find him a solid partner, man. He's too important to the future and, um, making sure we get that partner of his right is crucial in my opinion. Um, and then, and then the coaching, let's discuss the coaching a little bit. Derek Lalonde, I think this is just my opinion. If they end up missing the playoffs, I think he's going to get fired. Just my opinion. I haven't heard it from anybody. Just my opinion. I want to be very clear on that. You had a very nice cushion in a playoff spot heading into the month of March. A 20-game stretch, and you go 5, 12, and 3. That's a little bit damning. And it's not just going 5, 12, and 3. You know, it's it's how you looked in some of those games, too, and against some particular opponents. Um, some of the lineup decisions a little bit questionable. I really, if you look at, uh, if you look at some tools like, um, oh shit, what are they called? Like money puck or, or frozen tools online. Those are awesome tools. You can go on there and type in teams and it'll give you like forward line combinations. How many minutes they've played goals for goals against a bunch of different stats. And Dylan Larkin playing with either Alex Dabrinkit and Lucas Raymond, like we saw tonight, and they were dominant, or Dylan Larkin playing with Alex Dabrinkit and Patrick Kane. They were dominant. I think if memory serves, they've played around 25-ish games together. Um, like it, it should have been one of those two combos every single night. The whole year Dylan Larkin was available. Uh, any, any game that Dylan Larkin's played with David Perron has been a waste, I, in my opinion. Like, Dave, if you want David Perron to be on your team, I think at this point in his career, he's more suited for a third-line role. I don't necessarily hate him on your team, but trying to force him into, I mean, a first-line role some, now, some nights, I just, I just, I, I do not agree with that. Um, And just, uh, you know, some of the, some of the ways he's deployed um, some of his, some of his players and just some of the, I think the perceived lack of accountability. And again, us fans, we're not behind closed doors. I'm not trying to, to get on the internet and talk a bunch of nonsense. Like we just, we simply don't know, but you know, we've seen some of these veteran players make blunders that have cost us very important goals against points in some cases. And they're back out there the next game in, in, in a similar role or the exact same role. Listen, if you want to be brutally honest, 
every single coach we've hired since Scotty Bowman retired in June of 2002, 22 years ago almost, every single one of those guys has been a rookie or a piece of shit. Dave Lewis was a rookie, didn't work out. Mike Babcock comes in, kind of a rising star, still a little bit relatively unproven, had a nice year with the Ducks, ended up being just a psycho and an idiot, terrible human being to Johan Franzen um, and some others as well along his coaching journey that's hopefully over. But anyway, you move on from him and you go to Jeff Blaschel again, a rookie, as you're entering your rebuild phase. It's not like Blaschel was expected to be competitive in terms of playoffs or whatever. And then you bring in Derek Lalonde, who's another rookie. I believe that this group needs to potentially have a stronger, more experienced voice leading it. Dylan Larkin, I mean, what does he turn this summer? 28? Is he a 96? I think he turns 28 this summer. And his two NHL coaches have been rookies. I don't think he played for Babcock. Maybe one year. Could be wrong. I don't know. But like... I just really, I want to see, I like, I get it. Like, you don't want to sacrifice your own timeline. Iserman won't tell us what his own timeline is. You don't want to sacrifice that. But, like, the clock is ticking. Dylan Larkin's 20s are almost over. 25% of the Debrinket contract is almost over. You have a log jam of defensemen that you can maybe trade for a sixth or a seventh round pick if you retain some salary. And that's the thing too. If you can, if you buy out Petrie and you trade Sherratt and Hall and retain fifty percent, their cap hit goes from like ten and a half to like five point eight. And you only have the one buyout, and you retain salary for the two years with both the other two. You have your other retained salary slot becoming free uh, this summer with the um, with the Verona deal expiring. Got to find some ways to be creative. Um, you know, are you are you at the point where you need to consider maybe a, a true hockey trade? Um, the fact of the matter is that the DNA of this team is still, in my opinion, relatively soft. Um, these past five weeks, you've had probably maybe four or five guys who have been on consistently. And obviously, you didn't have Larkin for a time. And four or five guys might be being a bit generous. Um, This city is dying for a winner. And we're dying to experience some successful Red Wings hockey. And don't get me wrong. Like, we've been competitive into game 80 this year. That was really, really fun and exciting to be a part of. But you almost feel like with how they played down the stretch, like, does it even really count? I mean, were they were they outperforming their, you know, expected averages in January and February? Yeah, maybe. And has March and April been kind of a regression to the mean? Yeah, maybe. But, you know, data doesn't really factor in the human element, right? I mean, you're riding a high in January and February. And like you lose a couple games and then Larks goes down and it's just like something snaps. And I don't know, like, again, like we, like, I don't know, I got, I'll be fascinated to kind of when it's all said and done to kind of go back and like, look at the games and, you know, maybe the coaching staff tried to, to do too much and mix some things up when Larkin went down. I'm not sure. But like one thing is for sure, like not, none of these players, just too many passengers, too many passengers and um you know say what you want about a coach like torts like i mean nobody expected philadelphia to be sniffing a playoff spot and a guy like that just who isn't afraid to kind of tell it how it is who isn't afraid to hold guys accountable and like it's not going to work out for the flyers this year i'm afraid um but man torts just you know he finds a way to have some success wherever he goes right i mean and like 
success you don't think is coming. Like winning that cup with Tampa 20 years ago. I mean, the the Columbus sweep of Tampa Bay a few years ago after the President's Trophy um, winning season that they had. Like some coaches just find a way to, to get the most out of their guys. And, you know, that's way easier said than done. I'm not going to pretend like it's an easy thing to do that. Um, but in theory, you are one of the best 32 hockey coaches in the world. If you were the head coach of an NHL team, you got to be able to not only know the game, but you got to be able to know your guys. You got to be able to know what fires them up. You got to know, you got to be on top of your shit to like an exponential type of agree degree, excuse me. Um, Sergey Fedorov, Craig Berube, Gerard Gallant, just a few names I've heard. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But this has been this has been um, this has been a collapse, and there's blame to go around. And I think uh, I think every player in the room and every coach would bear some blame if you if if you really asked them and they had to be honest, I think every one of them would, would bear some of it because that's how hockey men are, but something's got to give man, because there are just too many fucking passengers wearing that logo right there. And it's too damn bad because, um, you know, we were spoiled for a long time and we had a dynasty for, you know, 11, 12 years or however long it was. Um, but you're, I mean, what, well, this will be year seven or eight without the playoffs we end up missing. Like we probably will. And, um, I mean, once, I mean, you're flirting with double digit years now. I mean, that's Buffalo Sabres territory. Um, and I understand that Ken Holland did Steve Eisman zero favors, but, uh, you're five years in and you do keep improving and I'll give you that. Um, but there was a lot of inaction done maybe intentionally over the last couple of months nothing at the trade deadline the only real meaningful thing that we did post trade deadline was call up simon edvinson which i think most of us loved and he should for sure be on the team all year next year um but you know um playoffs probably in the eyes of the team i would guess they, they probably um Probably didn't think they would be here either, but the fact of the matter is it was February 29th, 2024, and you were comfortably in a spot. And um, there's just there's a lot of people that, that uh, you know, we love our sports, we love our teams, and for us, we love the Red Wings. And um, it's just unfortunate that there's so many people who are just um, okay with this because – Inaction is action to a degree, in my opinion, from ownership to management to coaching staff and players. You know, there are a number of players on the team who need to have a really solid offseason and come back better. Um, and Lucas Lucas Raymond deserves an eight-year contract for sure after what he's done down the stretch here. And making the argument that he is the MVP of the team and not Dylan Larkin this year. So we will have to... See how it all plays out. They're obviously not mathematically eliminated yet going into game 80. You know, I mean, that's nice when you say it like that, but um, just a lot of crazy shit needs to happen for us to get in. And then when you do get in, you probably have a matchup with the New York Rangers anyway. And uh, who knows how that would go. <laughs> so um, Steve Eisman has a lot of work to do this offseason. There's a lot of work to do, has to get creative, and and we we really got to find a way to, to start hitting on some of our acquisitions here. If we're really going to be committed to overriping our prospects in the minors, then our pro scouting department needs to be on their shit and start hitting some, like some, at least some like base, base hits or doubles, man. Like we, they don't all need to be home runs, but I mean, they can't all be fucking pop flies either, man. A little baseball analogy for you as we wrap things up. <laughs> Sad night, Hockey Town. Sad night. Looks like the playoff drought is going to continue for at least one more year. And hopefully people who write some checks and make some decisions 
um, can feel this pain that we're all feeling tonight here a little bit. And, you know, I'm sure they do to a degree. Um, but I think it's a little different when you're a fan and um, just so much like family, emotional type ties into it and, you know, memories from your childhood and stuff. And it's tough to see what, what this has become, but, you know, hopefully that, you know, every off season, there's, there's a little bit of optimism that gets, that gets, you know, thrown into the air. And obviously, you know, when transactions start flying the draft, that's exciting stuff. So, but unfortunately it looks like it's going to be another sad ending this year, hockey town. Um, thank you for joining us tonight and joining me tonight. Force going to be here. Son of a, you know what, but appreciate you guys. Appreciate this team. Even when it lets me down, appreciate being able to hang out with you guys and talk some hockey. Um, and hopefully we're just one year closer to being back in the playoffs and competing once again. So this has been hockey town hangout. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight, gang. And hopefully we'll talk to you in better spirits next time. See ya. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast, hockey town hangout on YouTube, Facebook. Google Play and Apple Podcasts.